Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, a professional photographer for about 25 years, and thanks for watching my free tutorial on the Canon R6. First, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to this channel. This video is going to take a lot of work. I'm going to be real tired by the end of it. Subscribing gives me a little bit of thank you, and it lets you see our new videos for free, new camera tutorials, new camera reviews, and photography tutorials. If you have a camera other than the R6, we probably have a tutorial for it at this link. Send your friends here so they can have their own tutorial. You should grab a copy of the Canon R6 manual and store it on your smartphone. Go to sdp.io slash r6 manual. You'll see our sdp.io links there. It is 872 pages long. That is too long. But you can search through the PDF and quickly find something that you're looking for. You can't search through the menus on this thing. So that's kind of the quickest way if you are in the field and you forget something. It's very important to install the firmware updates for your Canon R6. Go to Google, search for Canon R6 firmware update, and it should take you to the right page. Canon occasionally releases these software updates that add features. These have been really, really important in the past. In fact, if you watch everyone's earlier views of the Canon R6, we had major problems, like it was constantly overheating. Canon fixed that with a firmware update. Thank you, Canon. Most recently, they allowed me to record video to two card slots, and that was a big deal. That meant I was going to use this as my main day-to-day -day camera. If you do want to get notifications for those firmware updates, the camera's not going to tell you. You have to manually check it every now and then. I follow uh, canonrumors.com. They'll pretty much always mention it. The lenses get firmware updates, too. Anytime you buy a lens, make sure that it has a firmware update. And every eh, couple of months, you might want to check and see if there's anything new. First tips for people upgrading from a DSLR. This is a mirrorless camera that adds a whole bunch of capabilities. But the one you're probably going to miss is the flip screen. The flip screen here is extremely useful. On your old Canon DSLR, it probably didn't work that well. If you wanted good autofocus, you pretty much had to hold the camera up to your eye but you can get great autofocus, equal autofocus, by using this rear screen. It allows you to shoot from different angles. Pop it out, shoot from down low, from waist level, hold it up over your head like this, be in front of the camera, include yourself as part of the story. Use the versatility that the flip screen and mirrorless camera capabilities provide to get the most out of your camera. You might have DSLR Canon lenses, what they call the EF lenses. You can adapt all of those to your Canon R6 and it will work very well. You just need the $100 EF to RF adapter. Look, I have one of my favorite Canon DSLR lenses is this 24F14. And I have the EF to RF adapter here. You can see it's not a teleconverter. It doesn't have any optics. I can just connect it to the lens and then I connect it to the camera body and it works pretty much like a Canon 6D or 5D Mark IV, whatever DSLR you might have been using. This also means if you're shopping for lenses for your Canon R6, you should include all Canon DSLR lenses. You can get very good deals on them. One of our sponsors, KEH, sells used gear, and we have a 5% coupon code here, TNC Shop. Go to sdp.io slash buy now to shop from them. You can also sell them your old used gear at sdp.io slash sell now and get a 5% bonus with TNC Sell. If you can upgrade your DSLR lenses to the mirrorless, RF lineup, you should. The RF lenses are consistently 100% better than the DSLR, uh, DSLR lenses, but the DSLR lenses are a good standby in the meantime. This camera has USB charging, which your previous camera might not have. On the ports on the side here, you just need to flip open this top one here, the USB port, and there you can see the USB-C port. Not all USB-C chargers will charge it. So if you're planning to take a trip and you want to not have to carry a separate battery charger, test your charger first. My MacBook Pro charger works. The charger in my car works, but other ones don't work. The battery life on this can be a real challenge. It will run out of batteries faster than a DSLR might, so you should get a second battery. This sdp.io link will take you to a place where you can buy it. Still, you can also get like a USB-C battery charger and charge it in the field. That really helps. I want to give you a few tips for getting the most out of your battery performance. And now I'm going to actually hook up a recorder so I can record the menu. First hit the menu button and go to what I call camera eight. That's this icon here on the eighth page. You'll see the display performance menu option here. Power saving will reduce the battery usage 
or you can pick smooth. Smooth shows it at a higher frame rate. It, it's better to have it at smooth, but your battery life will disappear noticeably faster. The next setting I suggest you change is to enable airplane mode on the Wi-Fi menu here, page one. Select airplane mode and select on. If you've never used Wi-Fi, this won't make a difference, but it's easy to leave Wi-Fi on and then have a dead battery. So I leave airplane mode on by default and turn it off only when I'm using the wireless capabilities. Another power saving option is under the wrench icon up here on page two. You'll see power saving. You can select that and change how long it takes for the display to turn off. One minute is okay, but if you wanted to squeeze a little more battery life out of this, you could reduce it. It turns on really fast, so it's generally not a problem. You also have eco mode here that you can turn on. This just reduces battery usage a little bit. The biggest suggestion I can make is every time you're done taking pictures is to turn the camera off and then get in the habit of, as you pick it up, turning it back on. It should turn on really, really quick. Hey, have you ever been in the heat of the moment and you forgot something? That's human error and it can totally screw up your pictures. The way I help deal with this is I've made a sticker that I stick in this otherwise unused space right here. You can get my template at sdp.io slash sticker. Customize it with your own preferences and then print it out. And the next time you're in some beautiful, amazing moment and you don't want to screw it up, go through your checklist. It's also a great way just to spark creativity. I'm going to go over the physical ports on the left side of the camera here. They're all labeled, so it's pretty clear. You have the microphone port here at the top and the headphone jack below it. They're labeled on the inside too, but I have seen people get those backwards. It can be confusing. And then below this, you have a port for a wired remote. You'll probably never need that because you, well, there's a wireless remote that's excellent and timers and things kind of negate the previous need to have a wired remote. On the right side here, you have the USB-C port that you can use for transferring pictures to a computer or a mobile device with a USB-C cable or for charging it with a proper charger. Below that, you have a micro HDMI connector. That's what I am using to record the menus and such. If you want to use a field recorder like I am, you'll need a micro HDMI to HDMI recorder. You can also use it to like hook it up to a TV if you want to do a slideshow or something, but nobody really does that. Speaking of remotes, this is the wireless remote that I prefer. You can get it at this link here. It's like 40 bucks. It works great. The charge lasts a long time and it's just a good way to trigger your camera from remote places. Let's talk about the memory card configuration. In the memory card door here, you'll see it has two SD card slots. You should always be using both of these because memory cards do fail and you don't want to lose your pictures. I did a poll of over 4,000 photographers. New people who hadn't taken many pictures had never had a card fail. But of those people who'd taken more than a million photos, about 75% of them had had a card fail and lost pictures at some point. I've had half a dozen cards fail over my career. It doesn't happen all the time, but it is kind of inevitable. No card is 100% reliable. Things fail. And if your pictures are important to you, especially if you're shooting professionally, you should configure it to shoot to both cards. I'll show you how to do that now. Press the menu button and go to wrench page one. This first option here, record funk and card folder select. Uh, go down to record options here and choose record to multiple. Do that for both stills and video. Now it will record to both cards equally. If one card fails, no problem. You got to back up one. If you take the first card out, and you're going to put it in the memory card and then it slips and it falls through a drain, no problem. You've got to back up in your camera. If you're traveling, things can happen. Somebody can steal your bag. Before you go anywhere, like when you're on your way home, take one of the cards out and put it somewhere else. Put it in your suitcase that you're checking and keep your camera with you. Keep those two cards in separate places whenever possible. I'm an old IT guy, so I'm always thinking about redundancy, right? I want to tell you about the difference between RAW versus JPEG, but I made a whole separate video for it at this link here, sdp.io slash RAW v JPEG. This camera actually supports two types of RAW and basically two different compressed formats. We have RAW and Canon RAW, and Canon RAW is like a little bit compressed, but people have a really hard time ever discerning any difference. It saves you space, so you'll be able to fit more pictures onto a memory card. Your pictures will transfer faster. They won't cost as much to store in the cloud. So I strongly suggest using Canon RAW instead of regular RAW. But if you are like a stickler who wouldn't want to lose any amount of picture quality, then go ahead and stick with regular RAW. 
RAW versus JPEG. RAW will give you more dynamic range and allow you to do more editing, It'll allow you to recover shadows that might have otherwise been lost. I'll show you how to set this now. We're going to go into the menu system. It's on camera, page one, and it's so important that they made it the very first option here, image quality. You can see I can switch the front and back dials to control whether it's recording RAW only, like it is now, JPEG only, or both RAW and JPEG at the same time. There's really no need to ever use these lower quality JPEGs uh, unless you really need to save space, but it's only a 20 megapixel camera, so it's not that big of a deal. Selecting C-RAW, you can see I just need to go to this third option here. You'll notice I am using the dials and the control stick on the back to navigate the menus because I'm recording it to a separate recorder, so I can't use touch. But using touch is a far easier way to go about it, so please do that. Besides JPEG, which is the compressed format, this camera can record files in HEF format, which is what iPhones use. JPEG is like this 30-year-old standard for compressed files, and HEF is just a newer format that stores more data. It can edit better and takes up less space. So there's no reason you wouldn't want to use it, except some older editors can't support it. But things like Lightroom, which I use, actually do support it pretty well. To turn this on, it's not logical at all. It's not under the same menu. You have to go to camera, page two, and then go down to the confusingly named HD PQ settings. Set this, set HD PQ to on, and then go back. And if we go back to image quality here, now you can see where it used to say JPEG there, now it says HEF. So we can still select different HEF formats. I would suggest taking a couple of sample pictures in HEF format and making sure that it works properly with your editing software. Speaking of editing software, I personally use Lightroom Classic. I've written several books on the matter. I'm also in the process of publishing a book on standard Lightroom. When you go and check out Adobe, you'll see they have separate Lightroom and Lightroom Classic products. The biggest difference between the two is with Lightroom, you have to pay Adobe to store your pictures. With Lightroom Classic, you can pick how you want to store your pictures on your own. Lightroom Classic has, still has a lot of capabilities that regular Lightroom lacks. If you're interested in checking these out, there's a free trial at sdp.io slash Adobe Deal. I'm going to give you a link to buy memory cards. I suggest getting a very big memory card because they've gotten pretty inexpensive. And so I like to use 128 gig or 256 gig cards so I never run out of space because nothing's worse than you're in the best possible moment getting the best pictures and suddenly the card is full and you have to go back and delete stuff, right? So you can get two 256 gig cards here for 150 bucks and that should pretty much last you. I'm also going to make a suggestion that you buy extra SD cards and stash them around your whole life. Put an SD card in your car's glove compartment. Put one in the drawer in your office. Put one in your wallet or your purse. This doesn't have to cost you much at all because I'm saying buy super cheap cards because at some point in your career, you're going to be caught without a memory card because you're going to have taken it out or you're going to fill up the space on your current card and you'll need to switch back to something. Go to stp.io slash extra SD to buy the very cheapest SD cards that I could find. And we actually use those cards and they're 100% reliable. They're not the best, but they're better than nothing. I'm going to show you how to format your card now. Hit the menu button, go to the wrench, page one, and then go down to format card. Select which of the two cards that are labeled on the inside and then select OK. You don't really need to do a low-level format, and I personally don't format my cards every single time I unload it because I use the files on the card as a little bit of a backup. Like, I don't want to copy all my pictures to my computer and then have my hard drive fail. That's something that happens. That's something that's happened to me, and the fact that I didn't immediately format it allows me to have an instant backup. That's another reason why you should get a nice big card, so you're not constantly pressured to format it so you don't run out of space. Related to memory cards, I want to show you a setting that could save you. By default, the camera will allow you to take pictures with no memory card inserted. It, what does that get you? It's just, it's misleading and it has screwed me over because I've tested my camera, I've heard the shutter click, and I thought, I'm good to go, only to get to location and realize I didn't have a memory card. So hit the menu button, go to the camera icon, page six, and release shutter without card. Set that to disable, set it to off. And now your camera won't take pictures when you don't have a memory card. The camera sensor here will occasionally gather some dust, and that dust is going to show up on your pictures. You can often fix this automatically. Go to the wrench icon here, page four, and then go down to sensor cleaning. 
Notice that auto cleaning is set to at power off. Every time you turn the camera off, it's going to shake the sensor and try to get rid of dust. But you can also do clean now. Clean sensor now and the sensor is going to shake a little bit. The dust should go flying off. Sometimes you'll have a really stubborn piece of dust. It shows up in pictures, but it really shows up in video. To get rid of that, buy this kit here, stp.io slash clean, stp.io slash DDR24. It's a swab. You put some liquid on it and wipe it across and it removes all the dust. I have a whole video that teaches you how to do that. I've done it many times. It seems very safe to me. Go to menu, do sensor cleaning, and then do clean manually. And what that will do is after you select OK here, it will sort of lock the sensor in place because it has sensor stabilization. So it's kind of on springs normally. And then you can take this off and it will stay exposed. You swipe the swab back and forth once each way, and then you turn the camera off. This camera has so many different settings. Fortunately, most of them can be accessed by pressing the Q button on the back. You can touch these with your finger or scroll through them with your uh, joystick here. And you can see this is almost everything you're going to change. Like I almost always use AI Servo, so I'm going to quickly switch to that. You can change the image quality by pushing the buttons that it shows there. Drive mode, I almost always use high or high plus, so I'll switch that. I never change the metering mode. Anti-flicker shoot, I'll talk about that in a bit, but you probably don't ever need to change it. White balance, auto white balance is generally fine. Cropping aspect ratio is useful, especially like if you want to shoot to a square format, like that nice Instagram grid, or you're creating something that will fit into somebody's home decor. You can select this and then use that back dial to change the crop, and you can see it will mask it off for you. The RAW file will still record the original full frame, but it helps you just compose the photo. You can record a video on this camera at any time by pressing the record button on the top. However, I suggest you move the mode dial over to the video camera. For one, on the back display as it previews it, it crops it down to 16 by 9 so you see the correct aspect ratio. But switching to video mode also changes the menu system, unlocking a few extra capabilities and doing things like showing your audio levels. So it's a pretty useful feature. Take a minute and plug our books and video training. Go to northrop.photo or this link here, and you can see we've written the number one book on photography. This is stunning digital photography. It's not just a book. It has 20 hours of video. Look it up on Amazon and it has more than 5,000 five-star reviews. Like People have loved it for a long time. I just updated it to include things like smartphones and drones because I assume every photographer now is working with multiple different cameras. You'll like it, but if you don't, I'll give you your money back. Everything has a full money back guarantee. We also have books on Lightroom and Photoshop. I have a photography buying guide that will help you choose which cameras and lenses to spend your money on, and I promise it will all save you a lot of money. Thanks for checking it out. Now I want to talk about using exposure compensation. Sometimes the camera is going to look at a scene and guess how bright or dark it needs to be with the automatic settings and it's going to guess wrong. It's going to over or under expose your photo. That's super easy to fix with exposure compensation. To adjust the brightness of the image, I'm going to half press the shutter and now I'm going to move the back dial up or down. And you can see the brightness of the image is changing. If you're using a Canon RF lens, this is cool. You can use the ring on the front of the lens here. It's programmable overexposed, underexposed, all by using this front ring. This camera has the standard modes that you're probably used to, manual, aperture priority, shutter priority. I'm going to suggest you learn about camera settings by watching these other videos here or by reading stunning digital photography. That'll tell you how these different modes work. There is one mode that you've probably never seen before and that's flexible priority AF as indicated by FV here, and that lets you independently change each of the different settings, and it's so flexible that you might never need to use a different mode. With your finger, you can touch any of the different settings at the bottom and either make them automatic or manually specify what you want the setting to be. Thus, you don't have to think, oh, I want, I'm in Aperture Predator now and I also want to control the shutter, that means I need to switch to manual, or oh, suddenly I don't want to control the shutter, so I should go back to Aperture Priority. You just think about the individual settings. If you're not a fan of the touch screen, you can use the back dial to oscillate between the different settings and then use the front dial to change them.
Why won't my camera focus? The number one answer is that the diopter is screwed up. The diopter is this little dial here next to your viewfinder and it's like a glasses prescription built in here. No, almost nobody has perfect vision. So what you should do is hold the camera up to your eye, make sure you can see it, and then adjust the diopter up and down until the numbers you see are nice and sharp. Don't look through the lens, but look at the camera's display itself. And if you hand the camera to somebody else, you're going to have to tell them to adjust the diopter, and then when you take it back, you're going to have to adjust it yourself. Another really confusing thing that screws people up is this lock button on top. When you push this, it is locked, and you can no longer change the settings. This happens where people are like, my camera's broken, all the buttons and dials don't work. It's just that they accidentally press the lock button. So push it again until it goes off. You can use the touch screen to activate the shutter. Normally with touch shutter, it just focuses where you touch. When you enable the touch shutter by touching the lower left corner, you can touch the screen and it will instantly take a picture. When you're working with the camera held out at arm's length, that's a really easy way to both focus and take pictures at the same time. The R6 has three different shutter modes and it's very important that you understand the difference. They're electronic, mechanical, and electronic first curtain shutter. First I'll show you how to change them. Go into the menu system and go to the camera page six. And now you'll see shutter mode. By default it's that electronic first curtain shutter. That is a good general purpose setting. You might also want to select electronic shutter. However, for some reason it won't let me do that with HDR PQ setting set. So I have to go back and change that. So strange. Okay. Now I switch the shutter mode to electronic. This makes the camera silent when you take pictures. It also allows the camera to take pictures at up to 20 frames per second, a dramatic increase from 12 frames per second. That makes it excellent for action, sports, wildlife, and the silent shutter is perfect for you know photographing a quiet jazz concert or something. But electronic shutter comes with side effects, especially when you're doing rapid panning or shooting fast moving subjects. It's called rolling shutter because of how the camera reads out the sensor when it doesn't have a mechanical shutter there. Here I am using an electronic shutter and a mechanical shutter at a sports field panning along with a fast moving subject. You can see with the mechanical shutter, the crossbars are completely straight. With the electronic shutter, they tilt to the side. That's what happens. Moving things become diagonal. Electronic shutters can also cause banding under artificial lights. You're going to run into this when you're shooting in a concert inside at night or sporting events in, an, uh, in a gymnasium. And it can absolutely ruin your pictures, especially with faster shutter speeds. Here is side-by-side -side pictures of the LED lights behind me at 1 500th of a second. Mechanical, electronic shutter. They look identical, right? But when we jump up to 1 1,000th of a second, now we see these bands appearing. And if I jump up to 1 2,000th of a second, those bands become even more distinct. So if you're shooting a concert, choose the electronic shutter, but use slower and slower shutter speeds, and it shouldn't be any problem at all. But if you're shooting like professional sports, you might want to be at one two thousandths of a second and that banding could become a concern. In those cases, you would want to switch to the mechanical shutter. So when you do use the electronic shutter, try to keep the shutter speed down. With some regular moving subjects, especially under natural light, electronic shutter is perfect. I just want you to be aware of the limitations. There's a menu option called anti-flicker and people are always like, why don't I just turn that on? I have never seen that it makes a difference. Here's how anti-flicker works. The camera is kind of watching the lights flicker on and off around you. They're, they're always flickering. They just flicker so fast you can't see it with your eye, but the camera can see it. And when you tell it to take a picture, it's going to say, no, no, we're in the middle of a flicker. I'm just going to wait until the lights switch on in that tiny fraction of a second before I take the picture. You probably won't notice it, though it can slow down your shooting. But in those banding pictures you saw, you saw that it was actually flickering on and off multiple times within a single frame. So it can't solve that. All it can do is delay a picture for a split second to eliminate the flickering. So it can help in some situations, but it's not the cure-all that you might want it to be. To turn it on, you can see on camera page two, here it is. I'm trying to turn it on, but because I'm using an electronic shutter, I can't do it. So I have to go back here and change the shutter mode to electronic first person curtain shutter and switch it to enable. Now, of course, you mostly need anti-flicker shooting when you have an electronic shutter because that's when the flickering really happens, but it doesn't make any difference. So if you're shooting with the mechanical and you want to go an extra step, go ahead and turn that on.
I mentioned that the electronic shutter lets you shoot at 20 frames per second. The mechanical shutter lets you shoot at 12, but there are some restrictions on when it will actually shoot at that higher frames per second. When your battery drops below 50%, the frame rate is gonna drop down. So if you're shooting sports or action, bring multiple batteries and swap them out and it will hit 50% real fast. You might be there in 20 minutes of shooting. So be prepared for that. On the main screen here along the left, you'll see it shows high plus in green. That means it's ready for a full 12 frames per second. But as the battery gets a little lower or circumstances are a little different, it will turn either white or white and blinking. In which case you will get the frames per second shown on this grid here. This is directly from the manual at sdp.io slash r6 manual. I hate it when cameras beep and this camera doesn't beep by default, but if it does happen to get turned on, go to the wrench page two, go to beep and select disable. I wanna plug our own store one more time because that's how we pay for this. We are a mom and pop shop. It's me and Chelsea. If you order something from Northrop.photo, I will go to the garage next to my truck and pull out a box and then mail you the book in an envelope, <laughs> okay? This is not some big production, okay? We're not some multinational corporation. You're just helping support a family. We have the art and science video training series that goes deeper than anybody does in YouTube with over 10 hours of training. And we have our professional portrait training series that will help you actually make money. You might also check out our flash training guide where we show you how to take great pictures with one, two, three, four flashes and all sorts of different flash modifiers and they're all priced super inexpensive. You can even get the video lovers bundle where you get all three together. So head to northrop.photo and I bet you'll find a coupon at the top of the banner there. Now I'm gonna show you how to use back button focus. Your camera by default will automatically focus when you press the shutter button halfway. That's okay. A lot of people shoot that way. I personally prefer to have complete control over when it focuses and how it focuses. And with the R6, there's a particularly good reason for that, and that is eye detect autofocus. This camera has amazing eye detect autofocus. It can find the eye really easily, but it is not 100% reliable. If you do not have eye detect autofocus on, then it might focus on the wrong part of the frame, especially when you're shooting a person. So, but when you do have it on, it might think it sees an eye in the background especially things like tree branches that have lots of little shadows in the bark, it will lock onto an eye and not lose focus. And that can make you miss shots. So what I do is I use a special variation on back button focus where I use the AF on button for standard focusing and then I use a little asterisk button to enable eye detect autofocus. That way eye detect autofocus only turns on when I want it. I'm gonna show you how to do this too. First, here's a video on why you might wanna use back button focus at sdp.io slash ybb. Here is my autofocus configuration. First, I set the drive mode to high plus. That's not related to autofocus. I just always like to rattle off a couple of pictures in case one of them ends up shaky. For the focusing mode, I always choose servo over one shot. Servo means it will track subjects as they move forward and back one shot, finds a focus and then stops. On older Canon cameras, we might have told you to use one shot because servo wasn't reliable enough for still subjects, but still subjects, moving subjects, it's always servo. For the eye detection, I'm going to the Q menu here. I turn eye detect off and then I enable one point AF. That's just how I prefer to autofocus, but I'm going to show you how to enable eye detect autofocus on a button. So I'm hitting the menu here. I'm going to go to the custom menu here, page three, and then customize buttons. I'm going to select this. I'm going to select the shutter button here and I'm going to set it to just metering start. This way, when I half press the shutter, it will not start autofocus. It's only going to activate autofocus when I press AF on or the asterisk button. Now I'm gonna scroll down to AF on. I'm gonna select this, and then this is going to be metering and AF start. It's already set to that. Now I'm going to scroll down to the asterisk button. This I'm going to set to IAF. And now eye detection autofocus will be activated when I press the asterisk button. So let's check it out on my little dude here. Notice. I'm pressing the shutter button, nothing is happening. This means I am free to manually focus and it will keep that manual focus. That's one of the benefits of it. When I do want general autofocus, I can just press the AF on and it will lock on. I can let go, focus and recompose just like you might with a DSLR. When I want eye detect autofocus, I'm gonna press the asterisk and you can see it's locking right on to the eye. You also have the option of animal IAF. Hit the menu button here, go to the AF menu, page one subject to detect animals or no priority. 
You can select animals and it will still find people, but it will prefer animals over people. And no priority means it'll just find any eyes in the scene. If you're switching between animals and people, no priority is a pretty safe bet to just leave it on all the time. If you don't take pictures of animal, just leave it on people. Again, it's not 100%. If you're shooting wildlife, it's going to work great most of the time and then it's going to sometimes leave you frustrated. There's a few tricks for manually focusing. If you use back button focus, you can just grab the focusing ring and manually focus at any time. You can also switch the switch on the lens to manual focus. And now you'll see it's showing me a little distance measure by default and now it will not autofocus. If I push the magnify button on the back, it will zoom in. And that is a really sure way to lock onto focus. In fact, that's the only sure way to really lock onto focus. We also have the option of focus peaking, which highlights the highest contrast parts of the picture, sort of helping you get generally in the area of focus. I'll show you how to enable that on AF page two. You'll see MF manual focus peaking settings. Set that, select peaking to on. The level here should generally be low. And then the color should be something that's not in your scene. So if you're photographing something red, red peaking wouldn't show up well, so you want to switch that to like blue, but I'll leave it at red. I showed you how to customize a few buttons, but there are many others that you can customize from the custom menu settings up here, page three. You can customize dials, which is things like the direction or what the different dials do. And you can also customize the buttons or the control ring direction. And if you screw things up too far, you can just clear your customized settings. I shoot portraits, I shoot sports, I shoot wildlife. They all have different sets of camera settings and it's not just shutter speed and aperture, but it can be focusing mode, even raw versus JPEG, a bunch of other things. It would take me a while to get my camera set for each of those different scenarios, right? So what I do is I set it up for one of those settings and then I save it in C1, C2, C3, which are groups of customized settings. I'm gonna show you how to do that now. First, put the camera into the mode that you want to shoot. So let's say we're doing sports here. Let's say it's professional fast athletes, so I'm gonna be at one two thousandths of a second. Set the ISO to auto. Set the focusing mode to expand AF area, which is good for tracking. I'm in servo AF already. Now that I've got it set up, I'm going to go into the menus. I'm going to go to the wrench page five, custom shooting mode, and I'm going to register the settings. Let's say sports are going to be C1. I'm going to set that to C1. Now let's go to portrait. So I'm going to, let's say I'm going to drop this down to the sync speed, one two fiftieth of a second. I have it wide open. And for the sake of demonstration, I'll turn on eye detect autofocus. Now I'll go into the menus here. I'll do custom shooting mode, register settings, custom shooting mode C2. This will say my portrait settings as C2. So now sports are C1, portraits are C2. Anytime I want to go back to my sports settings, I just move the top dial over to C1. And bam, you can see I'm at one two thousandths of a second. Suddenly I'm shooting portraits after the game of the winning team. Bam, C2, I'm in portrait mode. Take advantage of that to customize it according to how you use it. The info button on the back allows you to oscillate between different settings. Pressing the info button shows your histogram, or it clears all the unnecessary clutter so you can focus on what you're doing, or it fills the entire screen with your camera settings, which can make it a little easier to touch and adjust settings. So keep just switching between the info mode until you get to the amount of settings that you want. This works just as well when you have your eye up to the viewfinder. It can also work when you're reviewing pictures. If you never use some of those settings, you can get rid of them. Hit the menu button, go over to camera page seven, go to shooting info display, shooting info settings, and here you can see all the different settings and you can turn some off. Like this is too cluttered for me. So I'll just turn that off. And now when I switch between the info settings, it won't show up. You might also find some other interesting settings here, like whether the histogram displays for brightness or RGB. You can learn about that in Sunny Digital Photography if you haven't already. Under VF Info Toggle Settings, you can change the settings that appear when you're using your viewfinder because they're categorized separately. I'll show you how to use the Interval Timer, which is really good for making time lapses, but it's also a good way to take self-portraits. Like you want to jump in the picture with all your family. What I do is I set the interval timer to go off every five seconds, and then I just set the camera firing, and I walk around and be with my family, and after a few shots, everybody gets into the meter of it firing every five seconds. It's easier than fussing with a uh, remote control, right? So go into the menu system here. You're going to go to camera page six, interval timer, set it to enable. Then hit the info button 
and you can adjust the interval. Right now it's at every 10 seconds, so I'll select that and then just go down to every five seconds and then how many pictures do you want it to take? You can scroll down and just go to unlimited if you just want it to take pictures forever. And then select OK and the next time you take a picture, you can see timer is blinking there and it's just going to keep taking pictures every five seconds until, well, you turn the camera off since I set it to unlimited. This camera has sensor stabilization. Any lens you put on it will be stabilized. It also works with lenses that have the stabilization built in. If there are RF lenses, it can work together for really excellent stabilization. That helps cancel out camera shake. Some people think you need to turn off stabilization when you put it on a tripod. With the R6, I've never found that to be a problem, so I leave stabilization on all the time. If you have a lens that has stabilization and you hit that IS off switch, that turns off both the lens and the sensor stabilization. So that will completely eliminate stabilization. You can also turn off stabilization from the camera page seven menu. Here we go, IS stabilization mode. You'll see IS mode, you can switch that to off. I have never needed to do that. I just wanted to show you where it was. You also have video digital IS. The way that works is it's electronic stabilization. It tracks the camera's movement and then basically it crops the video and the window moves up or down as you're moving to help eliminate the stabilization. Turn that on if you're like walking with the camera and you want a little bit of extra crop. You have the still photo mode here, either always or only for shot. If you want to save a little bit of battery, you can put it on for only for shot. That means that it will not try to stabilize until you press the shutter. But if you're using a long lens especially, the stabilization really makes it much more pleasant to look through the viewfinder because you'd be surprised how shaky your hands are. Hit the play button on the back of your camera to review your pictures and you can just scroll through them. You can use the touch screen to zoom in and out. They make it really easy. You can hit the info button to change the information that's displayed on the screen. If you want to customize these settings, you can go into the menu system here and go over to the playback menu here. And there's a bunch of settings here that allow you to do a lot of customization. I've never needed to customize this. So you can do things like convert a RAW file to a JPEG. I've never needed to do that. This is where it is, just in case you need to do it. In the upper left corner of your camera, you'll see a rate button. That allows you to rate a picture from one to five stars. Just press it repeatedly. Here, a little picture of my friend. Beautiful, I want it to be five stars. That's stored in the picture's metadata. When I import my pictures into Lightroom or whatever other processor, that picture is still going to be rated five stars. That means I can do a full photo shoot and cull while the client is relaxing or while the wedding guests are eating. I can go through my pictures and when I sit down at my desk, all my best pictures are already going to be rated five. It just helps me better utilize my downtime and allows me to spend less time on the computer, something I'm all about. You can customize that rate button. Page four, go to rate button function and you can change it to protecting or erasing images. Speaking of erasing images, I like to delete pictures that didn't turn out so I don't waste the storage space or the time importing them. You can hit the delete button at any time to delete a picture, but then you have to scroll to the left to delete it. The trash can isn't selected by default, but it can be if you go to the custom menu, page four here, you'll see default erase option. By default, cancel is selected, but you want erase selected. Only do that if you're not that afraid of deleting pictures and you want to save yourself a little bit of time. If you want your pictures to automatically review or you don't want it to review, here's where you can figure that. Go to camera page seven, select image review, and then here you can change the review duration. I set it to off. I don't want it to automatically show my pictures. If I want to see a picture, I'll hit the play button. Otherwise, I don't want to be taken out of the moment because you can miss a picture when you're trying to review your last picture. And then some people actually want to review their pictures in the viewfinder. Normally it only shows on the back screen, but if you want to do that, you could set that to enable, but I don't do that. DSLR shooters, you're used to not seeing the exposure previewed. When you look through the viewfinder, you just see what's happening in the lens. If you're overexposing your picture or underexposing, it looks exactly the same. My favorite thing about mirrorless cameras is they do preview the exposure, and I love that. But sometimes you're using artificial light, and if you're popping a strobe and you're looking through the viewfinder, well, the camera's not going to pop the strobe every time you look through the viewfinder, so it doesn't know how bright or dark things are going to be. And if you're counting on that strobe to light up the room, then the scene the camera sees without the flash is going to be underexposed and everything's going to be dark. If you're ever in that situation, go to camera page seven and go down to exposure simulation and turn it off to disable. 
and now your camera will always show a reasonable exposure just like you'd see through a DSLR viewfinder. I would use this anytime I'm using flash photography, except that normally with Canon compatible flashes, it will automatically turn off exposure simulation, so you don't have to worry about that. But I have found with some primitive flashes that don't talk the Canon communication protocols, it will not automatically switch, so you might have to do that manually, so I wanted you to know where it is. Bulb mode allows you to take pictures longer than 30 seconds, so you could take a 10 minute exposure and actually like show, show the stars moving. Obviously, you would only do this in a really dark environment. First, this top dial here, put it into B mode. Once you're in B mode, hit the menu button, go to camera page six, go down to bulb timer and select enable. Now hit the info button and set the exposure time. So here I can go up to 10 minutes and then select OK. And now when I hit the shutter button, you can see it starts counting down to my 10 minute interval. I don't want to wait this whole time, so I'll just have to press the shutter button again and it will stop. That's much easier than having to pull out a remote shutter timer, which we used to have to do. We're getting near the end, so one more plug for our store at Northrop.photo. It really helps support us, and I suggest checking out our bundles. We have our book lover bundle, our video lover bundle, or best, the everything bundle, which includes all the books and videos, plus tons and tons of presets and other goodies. We also have t-shirts and hats that can make you look great. Thanks for supporting us. This camera has HDR built in. HDR is high dynamic range where it captures a series of images, overexposed, underexposed, and properly exposed, and then combines those pictures together in post. You can do that in camera, and it's bad. You should not. It does a terrible job of combining the pictures. What you should do instead is use auto exposure bracketing. It's kind of weird. It's on camera page two. You see expo comp slash AEB. It's terribly named. Now I'm going to use the front dial and that bottom series of bars there is showing me that it's going to take three pictures. Minus two stops exposure compensation, zero stops exposure compensation, and then plus two stops exposure compensation. The first was properly exposed, the second was underexposed, and the third was overexposed. What do you do now? You need some software to combine them in post-processing and extract that extra dynamic range. I like Adobe Lightroom Classic myself, which you can get at Adobe Deal. You just select those three pictures, right click them, select photo merge, and then merge to HDR. This camera has really good wireless capabilities. It can connect to your smartphone and transfer pictures. It can even connect to your Wi-Fi network and send pictures to the Canon image.canon network where they will then get offloaded to Google Drive or Adobe Creative Cloud or even your own PC. So finally, you can have a true wireless life without having to pull the memory cards out. I'm going to make a separate tutorial for all of that because I'm tired because this is a lot. So check sdp.io slash tutorial where all my camera tutorials are and soon hopefully you'll see it. Also subscribe so it pops up in your feed. Honestly, I, the wireless capabilities work okay, but they're a little slow. And what I end up doing instead when I want to transfer pictures to my smartphone or a tablet or a computer is I use a memory card reader. Memory card readers work on any of those devices. All new smartphone operating systems handle the import and export, and you can use apps like Lightroom Mobile to process raw images just like you would on your computer. Here are links to an Android SD card and an Apple SD card, but you can find SD cards for whatever device you want. You can set the copyright info, so every time you take a picture, it adds your name to the picture's metadata, like copyright Tony Northrup. Pretty cool, right? Your pictures are autom automatically cap copyrighted in the United States. You don't have to do this, but I thought I would show you where it is. Go to the wrench, page five, and go down to copyright information, enter author's name, and then you can type it in like a little keyboard. Have you noticed how I have to like write down the page number of all these settings? Because even though I spent so much time with this camera, I haven't memorized everything. What you want to do is you want to add your frequently used menu items to the custom My Menu, which is something you build yourself. It's this very last menu with the star here. First thing you do is to add a My Menu tab. It's going to be My Menu tab 1. And then you can configure My Menu tab 1, select items to register, and then select the menu items that you frequently use. Like I often use bracketing, so I want that one to be part of it. Let's say I often also adjust the image quality. So I've added two of those things. I'll hit menu to back out here, and now you can see my menu, page one, shows those two menu items. You can add multiple tabs, add multiple items to the menu. It's a really quick way to access frequent settings.
Now I want to talk a little bit about the video capabilities of this camera. As I mentioned before, you can hit the record button on top at any time to start recording video, but it's better to actually switch the dial mode over to the movie mode. First, as I hit the info button here, you can see I can switch between different settings, but one of them will actually show me the audio levels on the camera. That can be really important as you're setting it up. Once you start recording, you'll have to hit the info button again to see those settings. You have two different modes here. Full movie auto exposure and manual movie exposure. There's no shutter priority, there's no aperture priority. You're just all or nothing. Though in manual mode, you can use auto ISO as I have set here now. I'll say the auto exposure works pretty good, so you usually don't have to sweat it, but I thought I would show you where that is. You have options for several different codecs. Under movie record quality here, you can see I can select movie record size, and you'll see all these different options. We do most of our recording with 4K at 59.94, which is basically 60 frames per second. It's nice and smooth, and using the standard IPB codec. You can see the next one here is light IPB. So we can choose for a given resolution and frame rate. I can choose between standard and light. Light simply compresses it a little bit more, resulting in a smaller video file size that's easier to transfer around, a little bit easier to edit, and it's fine. I have never noticed any artifacts with light. I'm just a stickler for quality, so that's why I use the standard one. Another useful video mode you should know about is movie cropping. I'll select that here, and then when I select enable, it crops down so it's doing a one-to-one -one readout of the center of the frame. And basically, it allows you to shoot a little more telephoto. So if you're at the long end of your lens and you want to reach a little bit further without cropping in post, turn on movie cropping mode to get that resolution without such a high decrease in quality. Back under movie record quality, you'll see a second option, which is high frame rate. This allows me to shoot at 120 frames per second. Now, I was in 4K at 60 frames per second. So when I select this, it's going to jump to 120 frames per second, but drop me down to 1080 HD, so a quarter of the resolution. This is good for slow motion. If you capture at 120 frames per second, you can slow it down to 30 frames per second with slow, four times slow motion. Note that high frame rate does not record sound. That is frustrating. What you might want to do is record, you know, your friend skateboarding twice. Record it once at full speed so you can capture the audio, and then record it again in slow motion so you can slow it down or you could use an external recorder and have somebody clap on camera. They need to clap because then you can synchronize the clapping of the video with the clap sound on your external recorder. Canon Log allows you to record video with extra dynamic range. You can turn this on by going to the camera menu, page three, down to Canon Log settings. Set Canon Log to C Log or C Log 3. C Log is the older standard. And it requires, I think it gives you like 13 stops of dynamic range. C-Log 3 is a newer standard and it gives you one extra stop of dynamic range. The C-Log quality will actually be a little bit better, a tiny bit better, if you don't have to extract as much dynamic range as possible. But if you're shooting your friend and their face is entirely in shadow and you want to catch the details in the sky and it's just a really high dynamic range scene, then go ahead and switch C-Log on you will need to apply a lookup table, a LUT, while you're editing the video. So you can Google C-Log3 LUT and then drop that into Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro or whatever you're using to get that video looking normal again. But once you do, you'll be able to adjust the exposure up or down, raise the shadows, drop the highlights, and it will look much better. Now with C-Log enabled, it's compressing the dynamic range. It's compressing the highlights and the shadows down so I could recover more in post. And a side effect of that is everything looks washed out. So look at my friend here. He's all washed out. I can fix how it looks in the viewfinder by going back into Canalog settings and turning on View Assist. So with this turned back to on, now we can see there's a little bit more contrast added back into the scene. You can also adjust the sharpness, strength, saturation, hue, as well as the color space if you have specific requirements. But again, you don't need to do all of this. Most people will never need to do all of this. You're better off just sticking with the standard settings. Let's talk about how it records sound. You almost never want to use the on-camera mic unless it's just for scratch audio where you're syncing up and pulling from another mic. You should attach an external mic to the mic import. That'll greatly improve your sound. You also don't ever want to use the automatic settings, again, unless it's just for scratch audio. You want to switch it to manual. The problem is, in quiet moments between words, automatic settings will often raise the volume up. So you'll hear like background noise will suddenly get loud 
whenever there's a pause and it's really frustrating to try to edit out. Go into the menu system, camera, page one, go down to sound recording and select sound rec manual. Now I can adjust the levels up or down. I'm going to need to do this. I'm going to need to do it so it doesn't peak. You can see as I'm getting close here, I kind of want it so it's just touching the yellows a little bit. Like that's a pretty good compromise. Then I click the set button to save that. Now as I'm recording video, you can see right now there's nothing showing on the screen. I'll need to hit the info button here so that I can see the levels on screen. And if you're vlogging, if you got that screen flipped towards yourself, make sure you take a look at those levels every now and then so you don't record a whole video with no sound, mistake I've made before. I want to remind you where digital IS is. This can help smooth out walking video, give you almost a gimbal-like effect. So to go to camera page seven, select image stabilizer mode, digital IS, and set that to on. That'll crop a little bit. If you want even more stabilization and more cropping, go to enhanced. Zebras help a videographer determine which parts of the scene are a little bit too bright because videographers often are shooting for post-processing. So they want to capture as much dynamic range as possible. And if you overexpose a part of the scene, it can never be reco recovered. Shadows can usually be recovered a little bit. You can quickly find the overexposed parts of the scene by using zebras. Under camera page seven, I will go down to zebra settings and set this to on. And you can see here I can change the pattern as well as where the patterns kick in. So there's two different patterns. Zebra level one is set at 70% roughly. And then zebra level two kicks in at 100%. So as I switch back to my view here, you can see around this highlight here, those weird lines, those are zebras. And it's showing me that that glare is a little bit overexposed. Notice it's showing at 70% and not 100%. I need to go back in to the zebra pattern and set it to zebra pattern one and two. So now I have two levels. And as I really overexpose something, there we can see the brightest parts are now showing zebra pattern two, showing it at over 100%. Earlier I showed you how to use the timer, the intervalometer, to record still photos and an interval that you could later stitch into a time lapse. That's a great way to make a time lapse. But if you're a vlogger, and you just need something quick and dirty of the sun rising over a period of time so you can drop it directly into your editor. This has a separate time lapse mode that will record a video. So go into your menu system, camera page five, and go down to time lapse movie. And now I can set time lapse to enable. I can set the movie record size to 4K, change the interval and the number of shots, and then when I'm ready, I just need to hit record. Whew, we're through the hardest part of the tutorial. Now I'm just going to make some suggestions for flashes and tripods and we can get out of here. The flash I like to use is not a Canon flash. The Canon flashes are super expensive. These Godox flashes work great and you can buy three of them for the price of a single Canon. I like the V862S. You can get one of the Godox remote triggers for it and it, it works fantastic. They have three remote triggers, but the basic one here works fine and doesn't take up much space. So hit stp.io slash C flash. If you're in a studio with strobes, what we use are the Flashpoint Explore 600 Pro, or you can get the AD600BM if you don't need like TTL and other features. It's a little bit less expensive. Those use the same triggers. It's so nice to be able to use the same trigger to trigger flashes and strobes in any combination thereof. Head to scp.io slash Canon to find those. Now I want to suggest two tripods at different price points. My favorite general travel tripod is the Be Free tripod at stp.io slash Be Free. They have both still and video oriented versions of the Be Free and you can get them in plastic or carbon fiber depending on your budget and how much weight matters to you. A luxury tripod, if you're a fancy person and you like the quality of things, how they feel, the Gitzo tripods are just amazing. Like they're all amazing. I use the Gitzo Series 1 when I'm traveling at stp.io slash Gitzo. And I use the Sony quick release plate. It is just a special quick release plate for pretty much any mirrorless camera that has a little lip on it and stops the quick release plate from twisting around. Get that at stp.io slash Sony QRP. One last plug for Northrop.photo, check out our flash video training series, which will show you how to get the most out of your flashes and will do so much to improve your pictures. It's more than an hour of video and it's super inexpensive and it helps to support your favorite photography teacher, Tony Northrop. Thanks so much for watching. In the comments down below, I'd love to hear your follow-up questions as well as tips that you've learned, maybe something I missed, about how to get the most out of your Canon R6. Don't forget to subscribe and give this video a like, please. Bye.